implementation. We're going to cover cloud service model, the delivery model and services, characteristics and terms, and objective storage concepts. The cloud service model, there, this is primarily what cloud is. You have IAS, PAS, SAAS, DBAS, CAS, BPAAS, XAAS also. We're also going to talk a little bit about accountability and responsibility, whether it's the customer's responsibility or the cloud provider's responsibility. IAS is the infrastructure as a service. Infrastructure as a service is outsourcing the infrastructure of a network. A good example of that is instead of having the domain hosted on the in the building, you're hosting the domain in the cloud. Companies that allow you to do this, like IBM and Amazon, they give you servers and they give you domain resources. So that way, all you have to do is log on to your computer and you're able, you're able to access the domain from any place. The next thing we're going to talk about is Platform as a Service, or PAAS. The purpose behind Platform as a Service allows programmers to be able to access the tools and be able to do what they need to do. Usually in Platform as a Service, they have applications and programs that are hosted out to them, so that way they're able to access those application programs from any machine. All they have to do is log into a web and then go to the server, and then they're able to do what they need to do to do their job. The next thing is Software as a Service. And Software as a Service are like email, Outlet 365, Gmail, YouTube is also a software as a service in a sense. That you're able to see these sources, you're able to do what you need to do and take care of these functions from any workstation. You don't have to be logged in to the same computer. That you can log in at work, log in at home, or even access them on your phone. The next thing is database as a service or DBAAS. What this allows you to do is to access your database over the cloud. Things like SharePoint are a web browsing function, but it's a database. So this allows you to access SharePoint or access that web page via anywhere. So that way you don't have to be at the same place or it doesn't have to be at your house. That you can host this in the cloud and, be, and other users are able to access what they need to access. Communication as a service or CAS allows users to be able to lease out information in the forms of VPN, VoIP, or PBX. The purpose behind this is so that way you can communicate as a service. Skype is a communication as a service. Google Chat is a communication as a service. Back in the old days, whenever people used to go on forums and talk on things like Yahoo, they were able to do that with communication as a service. They're able to communicate and talk with their peers and not have to pay for it. They're able to do it on a global scale. The next thing is Business Process as a Service, or BPAAS. The purpose behind BPAAS is so that way they're able to give out their business plans as a service to other companies if needed. Some BPAAS is whenever they offer more than one services, so that way you're able to access a little bit of the communication, but still able to access the infrastructure if, if needed. The last thing is anything as a service, represented as XAAS. XAAS utilizes everything, uses, utilizes a little bit of each, so that way you're able to do what you need to do when you need to do it. The best thing about this is you can access the domain and then offer access the software. So you're accessing the IAS and the SAAS. But then at the same time, maybe you have a few databases and you're hosting SharePoint. So therefore, you'll access the PAAS. Last thing we'll talk about is the accountability and responsibility of service models. With each model, they have a particular person that they apply to. The SAS is the end user. That's most of the time the many customers that they have. You're able to browse the web and you're able to access your email. So that applies directly to you. However, PAS is for developers. So therefore, they use that to develop. So it might be a group of people accessing it. IAS is for administrators. The administrators are the people that are actually accessing that, and they're able to perform their functions and to keep their servers online based off that. But who is responsible? For instance, with SAS, if you're accessing your Gmail, but then emails start disappearing or something starts happening inside of your email, well, it is ultimately the provider's responsibility. With PAS, the person responsible for that is the consumer, so therefore it would be the database people that are responsible for that. Same thing goes for IAS. It's the administrator's responsibility to make sure that their information is held and that their information is available. Next, we're going to talk about a few cloud delivery models and services. 
First, we have the private cloud, public cloud, a hybrid, which is a combination of the two, community cloud, on-premise, off-premise, and also the orchestructure platform. The private cloud is similar to the internet. It is basically the internal network, and it allows them to be able to do what they need. For instance, Google. Google's all around the world, but they still have a private cloud that you're able to, people from the Middle East are able to access information that they have hosted here in Washington State, and they're able to do what they need to do inside of the whole cloud. But yet, even though it's inside the cloud, as a user, you're still not able to access that information if you're not part of the Google's cloud. Public cloud is leased from a cloud provider to the customer. Most common ways of getting the public cloud is a pay-as-you-go, that you're leasing information, and as you download information, you're paying for it as you download it. If you use 100 gigs one month, well, you're going to pay for 100 gigs. However, the next month you use 10 gigs. You're going to pay for 10 gigs worth of data that you use. A hybrid cloud is the combination of the public and the private cloud, as mentioned earlier. You have some stuff that you offer locally. However, you're giving those, that information out to the people of the public so that way they're able to see it and they're able to access what they need to access inside of your network. Community cloud. A community cloud is an infrastructure shared with several organizations. For instance, say Google, Microsoft, and YouTube. They all come together and they create a cloud so that way you're able to access information inside of each other. That a person could be logged into YouTube and be able to access what they need to access from Microsoft or Google. Some companies offer their resources out to Microsoft Health Vault. Microsoft Health Vault is a collaboration of many other companies like Fitbit or maybe MyFitnessPal. The next thing is on-premise. And on-premise is where you host virtualization and information on site. It's the organization has complete control over the information and the servers. A good example of this is with YouTube. Everything is offered on site for YouTube. However, they give it out to people. So therefore, they're ultimately controlling everything. The next thing is off-premise. This is where things are hosted in the cloud. With YouTube, you're accessing off-premise because your videos are not saved on your computer. They're saved in the cloud. They're saved to YouTube. So therefore, on-premise is YouTube holding all the stuff, but off-premise would be you hosting it to them, and now off-premise is where you're giving it to YouTube, and now they're hosting it out to everybody else. One big thing to remember about off-premise is that the cloud provider does have control over some of the information, that if they wanted to remove things because it breached the terms of service, then they can remove it if needed. Orchestructure platform is a day-to-day -day task. It allows you to perform actions at specific times if needed. That if you work from 9 to 5, well then with Orchestructure Platform, then you're going to be able to access your information from 9 to 5 and be able to do what you need. But then whenever you don't need that information anymore, you'll be able to not pay for that, those services. And it syncs business requests with infrastructure. So therefore, you're able to make sure that your business is merged with your infrastructure and you're actually paying for what you actually need, and you're not having to buy extra things. Here's some common characteristics and terms that are associated with the cloud. You have elasticity, demand-driven service, pay-as-you-go, change-back, ubiquitous access, meriting, multi-tendency, and cloud bursting. Elasticity is enabling computing resources to be moved as needed. It shifts resources across the infrastructure, and this allows you to be able to move maybe Maybe one VM needs an extra core. Well, Electricity will allow you to move one core over so that way you can get the full functionality of your network and your infrastructure as needed. Electricity also allows you to increase workloads when needed, that maybe large amounts of services are needed for the, the databases at a particular time. Well, Electricity will allow you to move those services over so that way you can provide the databases the proper resources that they need. The demand-driven service allows users to be able to access what they need via a portal. An example is that of this is whenever you're accessing your email from your phone, well then you get home, now you're accessing the email from your laptop or computer as an on-demand service. It allows you to be able to access it whenever you need it, whenever you want it. That if you go to work, you can access it there. You're driving down the road, you can access it in those locations if needed. The next service is pay-as-you-go. This allows you to pay for exactly what you need. 
you're, you're paying for the services either by time, hours, or by data being sent. Instead of always paying the same amount for services, you're paying for what you use. For example, at Christmas time, you're not really using the internet as much. So therefore, during that time, you won't be charged for all that excess data whenever you're not using it. You'll be able to save a little bit of money. The next thing is chargeback. And what chargeback allows you to do is to decentralize IT costs. It basically gives a little bit of money back based on what you've been using in the past. Another thing with chargeback is that each department pays for their service. For example, instead of IT being charged for all the data or all the information, that chargeback it is going to be the accounting department that is going to be charged for a little bit of information or the business department or possibly just the IT department for the platform that they're using or the infrastructure that they're using. Ubiquitous access is the same level of access from anywhere. Again, this is an example of you're on your phone, you're able to access it there. You're at work, you're able to access your information there. You're at home, you're accessing the information there. You can be on vacation and still be able to get work done. Ubiquitous access is what really helps most companies go to the cloud, that they can go on meetings and vacation to other countries and other places and be able to do what they need to do when they need to do it. Meriting is a tracking of IT resources. The main purpose behind this is so that way you're able to see what you're using and how much you're using, so you're able to judge. This is very similar to how electric companies give you power. They track your usage data so that way they're able to see if you're using more data than people around you or if you're using less. Also, you can compare your results to last year so that way you can see if you're using more data than you were using the previous year. This could help you in finding out if you've got issues inside your network. Just like with the power company, it would help you find out if you're losing power somewhere. Maybe your AC is going out and therefore you're using more electricity on your AC. Well, same thing for your router. Maybe your router is causing a lot of errors, so therefore you're sending more information. It allows you to track that. Multi-tenancy allows one instance to many users. This is very important whenever it comes to databases as a service, that a user will be accessing a database, but at the same time, 100 other users will be accessing the database and be able to use and be able to do what they need to do. But also at the same time on multi-tenancy, they're looking at their own instance. They're not looking at what their neighbor is doing. They're able to see their own instance and be able to perform their own functions without having to interfere with the people they're working with. Cloud bursting. Cloud bursting is very important whenever it comes to the cloud. The main reason for cloud bursting, say you have a retail company, and in this retail company, your sales are really low during the winter time, but it during the spring and summertime, your sales go up really high. During the winter time, your resources will be on your actual land. But during the spring and summertime, your resources will be out in the web, and then the customer is able to use their services as needed. The next thing we have is objective storage concepts. On an objective storage concept, we have objective IDs, metadata, data blob, policies, and replicas. Objective ID is a ubiquitous identifier for the data and metadata used to find the data. The objective ID is mainly just a header, and it might be the name of the file, for example. That the objective ID allows you to be able to see what you're about to access without having to open up the document and be able to read it. Metadata describes each object in the database. It's used like a table for a database and contains the compounds of the data. It is the actual information inside there, and it allows you to get a better detail of what you're reading. Data blob is a binary large objective. It's primarily used in databases. Large amounts of binary data stored in a location to help copy between locations. When viewing a data blob, it primarily looks like a bunch of garbage, but it's meant, for be, meant to be with a database. So therefore, they're able to see and use the information as needed. You might pull up a document up in Notepad, but whenever you look at the document, it just looks like a bunch of garbage, a bunch of ones and zeros, maybe a few names here and there. But as soon as you pull that document on an Excel spreadsheet, you're able to see it's organized in columns and it looks neat. Policies are attributes associated with objects, similar to metadata, but for security mechanisms. Policies allows you to see an object and explains to you what you're allowed to do with that policy or not. For example, a common policy would be with YouTube. 
when you access YouTube, you have to agree to their policies. And if their policies strictly say not to give this information or not to provide this for copyright reasons, then you have to oblige to their policies. A replica is primarily just a copy of large data. And the purpose behind replica is so that way it has a ready backup. It's just a copy. For instance, whenever you have your information copied to G Drive, well, you're able to save that onto your computer. That would be a replica of that information. It's just a copy of it. Most of the time, replicas are used with virtual hard disks. That allows you to have a ready backup of that virtual machine if needed. Today, we talked about cloud service models, cloud delivery models, cloud characteristics, and object storage capacity. My name is Justin Lingham with Cyberary IT, and I hope you guys learned a lot.